Hail and hello, everyone. Welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, a Midgard Musings production. Join me, Jesse, your host, as we discuss random heathen-related topics and various other things in an attempt to find where, if any, heathen worldviews can be applied. You can support this podcast by clicking on the Linktree link in the description or show notes. You can also follow me on all of my social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and become a patron on Patreon. Join me every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central on all major podcast streaming platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and many, many more. If you wish to have your voice heard on the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, you can dial in to 615-671-9832. Thank you all once again for listening to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Joy and hail to you all. Hail and hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Um, thank you to everyone who comes back and listens or watches these things every week. Um, seeing a lot of positive growth, a lot of great interaction with um, you know the the videos and and the content that I've been putting out lately. So I do want to just start this episode right off of the rip by saying thank you thank you all for for helping contribute to the production of this of this podcast i think between um you know stuff that's going to come up between now and the end of season three plus whatever i've already got listed from all of your wonderful suggestions we've got enough content to definitely finish out season three and probably start season four um so um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in, in the, uh, the remaining episodes of season three are going to be thanks to you, you know, thanks to all you people. Um, so thank you again once uh, once more for that. I just, um, before I started hitting record, I was actually, I was getting everything set up and I was just about ready to, you know, start recording. And uh, I got a call from my brother, Gene, who... Um, is going through a rough time, you know, uh, this time last year, his father passed away due to um, complications of uh, COVID-19. And, um, you know, I talked about in the last uh, podcast about the events of Shadow Moot and how my, uh, my, my, my headspace and where I was for that ritual, for their hell bloat, was unlike anything I'd experienced before and how it all kind of lined up with when uh, Gene's father had passed away last year. Cause he, he passed away on Halloween, um, uh, which, which, uh, which is sun, a Sunday last year. And it was, um, you know, the weeks leading up to that, that I was, you know, working in my own way to kind of help Gene, you know, through any sort of, cause he was asking, it was, it was kind of like a, call to action as it were to anybody and everybody from all faiths all religious views for prayers for healing for all kinds of things and i remember um the 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 effort that i made you know last year prior to his father's passing you know was was a very powerful attempt on my part to reach hell you know um and having not reached that far but then this year having made it there uh, it was very profound. And then he called me tonight right before I'm recording to talk about some other things. We said, hey, how much time do you have? And I said, well, for you, I mean, I'll take whatever time I need. He's so he um, he had a, a a short you know, memoir to his father that he wrote um, that he was going to present to a bunch of people this coming weekend um, during a because they were, were going to do like a, a memorial bike ride. Um because because Gene and his dad and a lot of the people that were friends of theirs uh, all ride bikes, you know, they were going to do a memorial ride. There's there's pending 
inclement weather coming through and they canceled the ride. But this uh, memoir, this, this, uh, this, this piece that Gene wrote for his dad, he, he shared it with me. And I found out that I was just the fourth person to have, have heard it since he wrote it. And man, oh man, let me tell you what, beautifully written, beautifully orated. Um, and it was a true honor to get to hear that going into, you know, this and, and talking on a podcast in front of, you know, all of you people, hearing him talk to me over the phone, sharing what he shared. Um, while that's not going to be the topic of today's podcast, it definitely put me into a very, um, uh, like, like a state of mind of just it, all the emotions that, that he conveyed through that memoir, through what he wrote, uh, really resonated with me. You know, the, the calmness, the anxiety, the, the sorrow, just everything, just so many things that you, that one would experience when they lose their parent. Um, I haven't lost mine yet. It's going to come one day, but, um, hearing and, and feeling the emotions that he conveyed. It's like, I was right there with him. Um, so for everybody that's listening and watching, you know, the memorial ride for, um, his dad's name was, was Gene also, um, but he was known by his friends and his, and his closest people as the wizard and the, the memorial ride that was going to happen this weekend, that isn't happening this weekend. I would just, um, maybe just put this out here that, Whatever you do this weekend, uh, if you're so inclined and if you, you know, can think of to raise a glass, raise a drink, give a toast to the wizard, Gene Step. All right. So what are we going to be talking about this week? Comes from a post that I made a couple of weeks back asking, what should I podcast about this week? Um, and again, I've got a lot of great suggestions, all of which I'm going to be getting to eventually. Um, but the one that I wanted to talk about this week comes from uh, uh, Robert Etter. So thank you, Robert, who uh, he, he commented and said, have you, or sorry, how have you grown with your animal philia? Uh, once known, connecting with, and faring forth with it. Your philia is one of my favorite topics. So thank you, Robert. Uh, for the suggestion, for the for the great idea to um, talk about that on this episode. So this episode is faring forth with Orphelia. And I actually have a pretty neat, I have, I have several neat um, stories um, with regards to this, but um, I'm going to start with what I think everybody knows, at least anybody that's been listening to my, you know, content for any length of time is the myphilia. You know, so I have um, come to discover, come to find, I should say, the um, that myphilia is a heron. And for those that may be wondering what a philia, what, what, what we're talking about by philia, um, another word that might get... Um, used to describe what the philia is and in Norse perspective of things is, is fetch. So it's quite often a, a part of the soul complex that has been used uh, or, or mentioned in source material as this part of the soul that can travel outside of the body, be a guide, be a protector. It quite often manifests itself as an animal. Um, but it's uh, it's tied to your ancestors. Um, so there's and it's usually if it's if it's in in person form, it's um, uh, in a, a human uh, female form. But for me, my philia has been um, represented in the form of a heron. And I go to the river a lot. You guys have seen a lot of my videos and content um, that I post on like YouTube and, and all this that I'm pulling up a story that I'm going to read. So just bear with me um, where I see the heron that I, that I share space and time and, and coexist with the heron on my, on my river walks or the time that I'm spending on the river. Right. 
Well, when uh, Robert had asked about the, how am I faring with it, right? How am I um, dealing with the, how, how am I progressing since finding this philia, right? Well, the philia kind of found me and, and, and it's an interesting progression of things where I haven't in my whole life, and I'm going to be 38 next month, in my whole life, I haven't had um, that I would consider at least a close affinity to herons, right? I don't uh, recall ever in my in my youth growing up with all of the times that I spent in the woods and the swamps and the rivers and the creeks and, and do, going fishing on lakes and, and all this, you know, all the wild, all the time that I spent out in the wild, you know, hiking, hunting, fishing, camping, whatever. Um, I've never really felt like, you know, I, I could have said like the, the, the philia, my philia, my animal spirit, if you want to call it as such was, um, was a heron. And it's a little bit different than just an animal spirit or an animal totem. I, um, cause again, it has ties to your ancestry. Um, but one interesting thing, an interesting story that I did want to mention is you see in the background here by my chair or on the, on the chair, that, that, that fur that's hanging, that's a gray fox. Um, and I got that gray fox skin, uh, from a lady who, um, uh, when I was living in New York was, uh, living in a, an old mink farm, uh, showroom. There was years and years long before I was ever born, um, like back in the sixties, seventies, eighties, right. There was a, a gentleman there who, um, would, uh, farm minks and, and make, apparel like for coats hats and stuff for ladies he actually did a lot of um very he had a lot of high-end clientele so actors um people that have become pretty famous at the time and i don't remember some of his clientele but they were they weren't just like you know broadway actors that nobody had heard of you know there was some there was some pretty well-known clientele that he had and uh this lady was is um one of his wives had Again, not really kept the farm running as a as a mink farm, but she had all this, you know, she she worked in animal furs. So she was very, very, very good at um making hats and scarves and 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 things with uh the remains of of animal fur. So she would do like things like mink or um rabbit and and deer and and other other critters. Um but she had this fox. So she had, I think, maybe um trapped it or or something because they they can be kind of a menace especially when like we have farm farms nearby like chickens and whatnot foxes can tend to be a um, a pest you know and they need to be i guess controlled um to a degree anyway the, that's a gray fox so um gray foxes and red foxes fall under different animal categories you know the, the gray foxes is, is actually in the feline family they're more cat-like they climb up trees. They they their their um, their voice is more feline, whereas the red foxes favors the canine side of the family. They also have a kind of a weird voice too. They kind of like yip and laugh or whatever. But they're they're definitely more canine. They don't climb up the trees and stuff that I know of. Um, and it was interesting because I don't remember the circumstances. It might have been like a birthday present or something that 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 she had given it to me for, or might have just been a random gift. Because she knew how much I was into like wildlife. I used to have a whole like dresser full of nothing but the remains of animals. I had deer bones. I had um, squirrels. I had raccoons. I had a, a whole steer skull uh, from the farm that I had worked on, you know, because we used to raise, slaughter, and butcher our own beef cattle. I had vultures. I had turkey, crow uh woodchucks i mean i had i had a lot of things just i wouldn't say like carelessly strewn about on my top of my dresser it was it was more of like a display kind of like a museum matter of fact as i recall my uh we everybody called it jesse's dead things museum or dead things collection and so i guess she thought this would be a more appealing addition to the collection you know something of of a, of a you know the, the the color of his fur you know it wasn't just bone i actually had a coyote skull with the skin and everything on it, talking about things that I had. And um, so when I got it, you know, I, it was, I was a young teenager and I was at the same time during around that time of my life going to 
these private classes and learning a Chinese martial art called Xing Yi. You know, Xing Yi uh, is an internal Chinese martial art. It's not, it's not like, um, you know, Wing Chun or, or, or some of the other like more, I don't know, karate style. Um, it's an internal art. So there's a lot of focus on your posture, your breathing, internal, like uh, building your internal strength more so than your outer strength, having a strong core, having a strong internal, your internal organs. So like a lot of the exercises that we would do to prepare for our uh, martial arts training was like almost an hour long of just breathing exercises, um, stances, postures, Qigong is, is, is a, is what we did for like an hour before we ever did any of the, the katas, if you want to call it that they weren't called that in Chinese, but like the forms, the, the, um, the, the, the sparring, the practices and all that, it was learn. it was all about learning the internal system. And part of that internal system was identifying and, um, cultivating an animal spirit. And none of us would figure our own animal spirits out. The, the person who would give us that animal spirit was our was our uh, was our teacher. And everyone had a different one. Like there was a fellow there who was a gorilla or an ape. <laughs> um, there was another fellow there, and and usually like there, uh, some some of them some people would have like a multiple uh, multiple animals. So like, I know one guy was a tiger and a bee. Now that may sound crazy, but it was like a, a reflection of their, of, of, of a fighting style. Right. So that's where the animal spirit that would come out was manifested through the, the combative arts, you know, the, the martial arts, the, the practices that we would go through your animals, spirits or spirit would come out in your style. So, you know, the ferocity of a tiger and the, the relentless like pinpoint accuracy of a bee right was one guy and i became the fox i was the fox the reason why i was the fox was because whenever we would spar the guy that would teach us his name was jimmy he was always like i never know he's like i've been doing this for 40 years you know so he had a lot of experience with a lot of different styles multiple black belts decades of of experience knowledge who knows how many fights he'd actually been in but the guy was a was was, a, was amazing you wouldn't know it to look at him but he he was he was truly amazing he's like you know man i've been doing this for a long time and uh he says but whenever i grab a hold of you and we get to doing our sparring he's like you always figure out a way to be slick you know and kind of wiggle your wiggle your way out of a, of a bad situation he said you remind me of a fox and how you know it's hard to catch a fox um and it makes it difficult to to catch them because they're so wily they're sly you know he's like so you're you're the fox so for the years i was like i'm a fox you know and and um but i never like encountered foxes in my walks in the woods or i never you know had moments where i got to share space with a fox because again they are so you know elusive um and now all these years later um not doing the martial arts training anymore, right? Not really procuring or, or preserving that essence of the animal. It, it was like, it, it was, it was a, it was a part of me that came out and that was identified through a very specific practice and through a very specific uh, thing that we were doing, but it, nothing continued to, I guess, cultivate that or, or to nurture that. Now, very recently, the heron I've been encountering it and, and herons are, are elusive as well. You know, like they don't just, you don't just walk up to a heron and say, Hey, what's up, you know, deer and some other wildlife as they be, as they become more accustomed to human existence and sharing space, you know, you can very easily build trust with, with deer um, in, and even some other, you know, like songbirds or whatever, and just have that, you know, connection where you're almost face to face and close to one another. Herons, not so much. Now I've gotten fairly close to them because I'm out there so often, and because I've seen there, I've 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 gotten the sense that we recognize each other at least when I'm in the areas that they're familiar with seeing me in. Now, when I go in places of the river that I've not been very frequently, 
and I see a heron, the distance between us is much greater and I can't get nearly as close because they're like, well, that doesn't belong here. You know, this, you know, blonde humanoid, whatever, doesn't belong here. I've not seen that thing here in this part of the river before. So I'm going to stay, I'm going to only keep my distance. But the, the, the relationship that I've built with the heron has definitely been one of um, where I've, I've discovered my philia. When I go places, when I, when I meditate, when I walk the river, even if I don't see the heron, I know the heron sees me because they are, they are watchers. They're, they're like the guardian spirit of this area. Um, I can't tell you how many times I'll walk in the river and there'll be one nearby or that one, or I'll be sitting by the river and then they'll fly over um, or I'll, or I'll catch sight of them at different points in time. So, you know, getting, getting to the point in my life where I know that that is my philia has, has definitely been a, a revelation for me and, and, a, and a, an important part of my growth as, as a pagan, because going back to how the philia connect to your, with your ancestry, um, my ancestry includes, um, and I don't know any much more specifically than this, but Algonquin nation, Indian, Native American, you know, Indian, indigenous Indian of uh, North America. So the Algonquin tribes that have like, I mean, Algonquin nation is kind of an umbrella term for the North, Northeast um, indigenous people. Um, and I don't know that much other than what my father's told me. And it's been hard for me to get any really good stuff out of, you know, like finding genealogy or information. But I was told by my father who was told by his cousin and his cousin had done a bunch of like family research on their side of the family, like genealogical work before stuff like, you know, 20, uh, what is it? Ancestry.com or some of these other, you know, ancestry tracing sites before any of that, like this cousin of his did a bunch of research. And apparently we have some great, great, great ancestor, um, great, 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 uh, female ancestor of all things, which is again, why I feel like the heron is, uh, a f my philia. So a great, 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 whatever grandmother of sorts was royalty. She was, she was like the, the, the daughter of a, of an Indian chief. So a princess, if you want to may call that or whatever they would call them back then. <clears throat> and, um, you know, she married a, a European Dutch settler. And then somewhere down the line, like there's, that's where we come in. My, my dad's side of the family come in. So Algonquin and, and those people were marsh dwellers. Like they, they, they lived in, in areas that were swamp and marsh. So the heron was a, again, thinking back on like the ancestral connection and that it was a female ancestor. Every, like all the, all the, all the lines connected, all the dots, you know, connected and, and everything lines up. And I, um, I'm going to read you this really neat story about the heron. And it's a, it's a story of, of uh, uh, Algonquin, I guess, uh, background. So it goes that, um, and, and what's really interesting is it, it, is it involves a wolf. So I'm going to, I'm kind of, kind of bring this back into the whole fox thing here just a moment but the but the story goes that big blue heron was standing in the marsh looking at his reflection in the water and he raised his black crested head to listen two little white weasels had come along to the river they were mother and son when they saw blue heron they stopped to look what a beautiful big bird person said the one uh, said the son he is called blue heron he carries his head high Yes, mother, he is tall as a tree. Were I so tall, I could carry you across this swift river. Blue Heron was pleased to hear himself so praised. He liked to hear others say that he was big. He bent down low and spoke to the two. I will help you go across. Come down to where you see that old tree lying in the stream. I will lie down in the water at the end and put my bill deep into the bank on the other side. You two run across the tree, then use my body as a bridge, and you will get to the other side. They all went to the old tree lying in the water. Blue Heron lay down in the water at the end and stuck his bill deep into the bank on the other side. 
Mother and son, White Weasel, ran lightly and quickly across the log, over Blue Heron, and were safe and dry on the other side. They thanked Blue Heron and said they would tell all the persons in the woods how fine Blue Heron was. Then they went on their way. Old Wolf had been standing on the riverbank, watching how the weasels had gotten across. What a fine way it would be for me to, to cross the river. I am old and my bones ache. When Blue Heron came back to the marsh, Wolf said to him, now I know why you Blue Herons are in the marsh, so you can be a bridge for persons to cross the river. I want to go across, but I am old and my bones hurt. Lie down in the water for me so I can cross. Blue Heron was angry. He didn't like being called a bridge. Old Wolf saw he had spoken foolish words and decided to use his honeyed words. You are big and strong, Blue Heron, and that is why you, your body is such a fine bridge. You could carry me across like a feather. Blue Heron smiled at Wolf and said, Old Wolf, get on my back and I'll carry you across. Wolf grinned from ear to ear, thinking how easily he had tricked Blue Heron. He jumped on the bird's back and Heron went into the rushing river. When he got to the middle, he stopped. Friend Wolf, said Blue Heron, you've made a mistake. I am not strong enough to carry you across. For that, you need two herons. I can carry you only halfway. Now you must get another heron to carry you the rest of the way. He gave his body a strong twist, and Wolf fell into the, river, into the water. You wait here, Wolf, for another heron to come and carry you to the other side. Then he flew into the marsh. The water ran swiftly. No heron came, so where did Wolf go? To the bottom of the river. Since that day, no wolf has ever trusted a heron. So that story again was like it's 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 a story of a it has Algonquin origin, um, and I found it online. I'll I'll link it down in the show notes if you guys want to follow and read it because there's there's some more neat stuff about herons there too. But obviously, foxes aren't wolves, right? But the fox was never my philia. The fox had nothing connected to me. It was just a manifestation of how I would fight or how I would figure out my way out of a tricky situation. You know, there was there was essences of the fox's nature and the, and the fox's wiliness or slyness that would come through um, in my fighting style. But it wasn't ever connected to me through ancestry like the heron is um and seeing again seeing how the heron has made himself manifest to me at different points in time while i'm in the river and even when i'm not in the river it's like you know i step into the river and i become the heron like my senses become more in tune i i, I go slower i watch i look for things i notice things that weren't there before um and I really take on the embodiment of, of the heron. So in, in the physical sense, you know, stepping into a realm that's not my own, right? So walking into the river, stepping into the river, it's, it's literally stepping outside of my conscious space, you know, like my normal space. I don't live in the river. I'm not a water bird, literally. But you have to become like this the that to to make it through there so all the river walks and even in you know the, the weather where it's becoming colder i still you know make it down there maybe not as frequently but i'll still go down there and um so you know looking at as like physically stepping into a, a different realm you can take that on um, to the metaphysical meaning of spirit travel and and connecting to the heron as a as a as the fetch part, you know, the, the, that, that spirit that travels, that part of your soul that travels in shamanic um, rituals and, and, and spirit work like that, which I've become more in tune with very much recently. So faring forth with our philia, you know, um, how have I been ever since finding it? It's been, it's been so holistic and so, such, such a fulfilling experience. To, to have that, not wondering anymore, not being like, well, what's my 
and again, it's it's more than just my spirit animal because it doesn't mean entirely the same thing in in that context. It's it's again, it's more of that ancestral um, spirit that can take on the form of of an animal. And I know that I think in in some of the sources, you know, it 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 takes on a very specific form, you know, or in some of the sagas where you hear about it, it takes on a very specific form. Um, but for me, I, I don't know. Like there, there's no question about the heron is, is a, is my female ancestors. And I call him him, right? I say him, but he, it, she, whatever. I don't, it doesn't really matter at this point, but the heron is definitely been a companion, a guide, a mentor, um, all of those things, you know, something that has really fulfilled my, my spirituality as of late. You know, and it's and it's crazy to me that it took all this time to manifest itself with me. Nearly 40 years old, more, you know, halfway through my life at the prime of my life, whatever you want to call it, that uh uh just now figuring this out, or it's just now making itself manifest. You know, so I'm wondering for for all of you people that are listening and watching, Robert, maybe since you know this is one of your favorite topics. Um, how long has it been since you, or have you yet, um, discovered your philia? Has your philia made him or herself manifest to you? And what is your philia? Who is your philia? How have you incorporated this into your, uh, you know, spirituality, your practices, and how have you kind of fared forth with the philia? I would be definitely, uh, interested and curious to know. Um, and I'm excited to continue to see what happens with my philia and see where we go together, where he or she takes me when I'm, I don't know, viewing the world through different eyes or walking the river in different legs or flying the air, you know, on, on different wings. It's a, like I said, it, it's such a, it's such an incredibly fulfilling experience to, to, to be familiar to have that familiarity with a with a with another living being that is not human you know like when i've walked in the river before and i've literally crawled through the water on my belly like floated down almost like like a weasel almost you know like coming up onto this this heron and talking to him as i come up and him not moving you know just him kind of watching me and then walking on my two legs as the heron, as peers, you know, uh, him looking upon me as if he's looking upon a familiar being, you know, not letting me get too close because clearly I'm not a heron, but letting me get close enough where we recognize each other and we feel comfortable enough to be that close to each other, calling their name and then watching you and looking at you, you know, not just making a noise and having them watch you, but like having a conversation and then putting their focus on you, giving you the time of day, the, 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 the attention that indicates that there's connection there, you know, that, that you're, that you've made a connection with one of the Vatir. I mean, that's Another way to look at it, you know, like that. Yes, that's a that's definitely for me a, a, a physical manifestation of of our, my ancestral philia, but it is in the embodiment of the land vitir. You know, this guardian spirit that lives, walks, eats, breathes, sleeps, does everything that they do on this river that I, you know, visit infrequently, and come and and reconnect with myself and, and parts of myself, you know, whenever I need to, I don't know, recharge from the day, whenever I need to kind of step away from the modern baloney and, and BS that encumbers our lives, you know, whether it's work or whatever, you know, when I go down there and I, and I step my feet into that space and walk those, those, those waters, I, I, I become something different. So it has definitely been a great 
progression in my spirituality. Um, I'm so glad that, um, first of all, I, I started doing this, these river walks this year, you know, like this is, you know, I've gone down there before and I've, you know, kind of hung out, but I really immersed myself into that practice and, and really became um, a, a daily, almost daily ritual for me. Um, in, in despite of the, the blistering heat of the summer. And now as we get into the cooler, colder months, you know, living that experience as the heron does year in and, in, you know, year in and out in the cold and the heat, really getting to get the full experience, you know, not just doing it when it feels good outside, but doing it when it's doesn't feel so good. And then, and, and really getting in there and, and having that, moment to to reflect and, and connect in ways that you wouldn't otherwise so thank you uh robert edder for the suggestion for you know bringing it up and recommending that we talk about this i hope you all enjoyed that story and i hope you all found some value in me talking about my feely and that it has helped you maybe uh put your mind in a, in a place and put your feet in a direction or your you know thoughts in a in a, in a space to to connect with the philia yourself your philia um i will say that you don't have to force it if you don't know who your philia is what your philia is yet um, give it time meditate on it find find places where you feel the most at home away from the modern conveniences of life right for some, it might be the woods. For some, it might be the ocean. For others, it may be a desert or the mountains or the rivers. You know, might be in climbing trees, might be in climbing rocks. Might be in the day-to-day -day things that you do. You know, maybe it's not even just being out in the wild. Maybe it's out there gardening or maybe it's out there, uh, maybe it's, you know, um, doing uh, crafting of sorts, sewing, um, weaving, you know, I think of, I think of such, uh, amazing spirits that exist, the weavers, you know, spiders and, and the like that, that weave such amazingly intricate webs in such a short period of time, you know, or I don't know. I saw something recently, like my wife, she loves otters. She loves a lots of other, she loves animals in general, you know, but she, she shared something and she saw a picture of an otter that said that otters have this um, pouch of, of skin or flesh or, or whatever on their chest where they keep rocks and things that they collect. And I didn't know that about them, but she loves collecting various gems and stones and rocks. I'm like, hmm, maybe she, maybe hers is the otter, <laughs> right? So I don't know, like, think about it. I think, I think it's a fun thing to, to dwell on, to meditate on. And to find your philia, whoever or whatever he, she, or it might be. Um, so that's going to conclude this week's episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to like this video about the podcast episode on whichever platform that you're following it on. Check the link tree link that's in the description and show notes of this episode, like always, uh, for all the ways that you can support Midgard Musings and the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. It is one and the same. I just use the platform to distribute it. So any which way that you want or are able to support monetarily, all of the links are in the link tree link. Buy some merchandise, sport some really cool apparel, you know, um, become a patron on Patreon, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow me on all the social medias, which cost you nothing, by the way. Um, and it's a great way to help grow this, this little community that we have here. So I want to thank you all, especially to my patrons and my channel members on YouTube for the ongoing monthly uh, monetary support that you provide and offer. It is greatly appreciated and it really helps me keep going on with these things and, and uh, you know, inspires me to try to do better each time. So thank you all so much for tuning into this week's episode. Until we talk again, may the gods continue to notice you and may your ancestors smile upon you.